Hey y'all, what's good? And welcome to my channel. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you to all of my subscribers. I appreciate you guys so much. Let's remember to have healthy dialogue, be respectful to ourselves and to each other, and to challenge the argument and not the person. Let's get it. Euclid mother accused of killing her four-year-old daughter, Anaya Day Garrett. Last March gave police two different stories about the final hours of her daughter's life. Sierra Day, 24, and Deontay Lewis, 27, each face up to life in prison without parole if they are convicted of charges, including aggravated murder, murder, endangering children, and permitting child abuse in Anaya's death. A Euclid police officer interviewed Day and Lewis on the day Anaya was pronounced dead. Day told two different versions of what happened before Lewis called 911 to summon paramedics to the apartment. Both versions began with a girl falling ill after a trip to Red Lobster. During an interview at the apartment, Day said Anaya had stopped eating and was acting sick after the trip. On Sunday, the day Lewis called 911, Anaya needed to go to the bathroom. Day said she took the girl into the bathroom and helped her onto the toilet, then went into another room. Day then heard a thud and discovered Anaya had fallen off the toilet. Day said Anaya became unresponsive a short time later. In a second interview at the apartment, Day said she turned on an air conditioner because Anaya had complained the apartment was too hot. Day also said Anaya wanted to take a bath, so Day drew one for her daughter. Day said in the second interview that Anaya tried to use the toilet on her own, but fell off and became unresponsive. The officer, as well as paramedics, who were the first to the scene and who testified in court on Thursday, said they found Anaya lying on the living room floor directly beneath the window air conditioner. The girl was wearing a winter coat, winter hats, pants, socks, and several police officers and paramedics noted in their testimony that the apartment had been recently cleaned and one officer said he could smell cleaning supplies, including bleach, as well as rotting meat. Crime scene photographs showed a host of cleaning supplies, including bleach, carpet cleaner, and window cleaner lined up on the kitchen's counter. A vacuum cleaner was plugged in near the kitchen and a broom was also leaned against the kitchen wall. There was no fresh food in the apartment's refrigerator and two half-eaten bowls of Mexican food set in the microwave. The sheets had been stripped, stripped off Anaya's bed and the mattress smelled strongly of urine. Investigators also found paperwork from Cuyahoga County Juvenile Court that had been ripped up and thrown into the trash can. Anaya's father, Michael Garrett, was recently and actively seeking custody of the girl at the time of her death. Several of Friday's witnesses brought into sharper focus just how emaciated Anaya was when she died. An emergency room nurse testified the girl was cold to the touch and skin and bones when paramedics rushed her to the hospital. Police officers noted Anaya's joints were visible, and she had bruises and injury marks on her back and legs. Another police officer said rigor mortis had began to set in, and the girl was so stiff at the hospital that her limbs did not move when police rolled her body over to photograph her condition. Lewis's defense lawyer said in opening statements Thursday that Lewis did not live with Day and that he wasn't involved in Anaya's care as much as prosecutors allege. An employee of the Cultural Gardens apartment complex testified that when Day signed the lease to move into the apartment one month before Anaya's death, she did not list Lewis's name as resident. When police searched the apartment after Anaya's death, they found no evidence that a man lived there. Detectives said there were no men's clothes anywhere in the house and no men's soap, shaving cream, deodorant, or other toiletries located in the house. With a laceration that is not bleeding, 
you can count every rib in her little body. And they try resuscitative measures, knowing full well, based on their training and experience, that this child was already dead. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is going to show that the next day the medical examiner does his examination of the child, and he finds this four-year-old to weigh 26 pounds at the age of four, and that he finds her cause of death to be blunt impacts to the head with a subdural hematoma, and she is malnourished. Ladies and gentlemen, the charges before you are that of aggravated murder that purposely caused the death of Anaya Day, who was under the age of 13 years of age at the time of the commission of the offense. Murder did cause the death of Anaya Day as a proximate result of the offender committing or attempting to commit an offense of violence, and that felony is of the first or second degree of felonious assault and or endangering children and or permitting of child abuse, folks. Those are the charges. And like we said before, this court is going to give you all those definitions and all those elements. We accept those definitions. We accept those elements. We will prove to you that both of these individuals killed this child and the sorry death that she had to suffer. It was a long, prolonged death. And the medical examiner will tell you that because as a, re as a result of blood force trauma, she suffered a stroke that rendered her incapable of many human of many things that we do in our common ordinary day life, folks. So I ask you to pay close attention to the evidence that we are going to present to evaluate it, and you will come back with the only fair and just verdict in this case is to hold each one of these individuals equally responsible for killing this four-year-old girl without any remorse. Thank you. Baker Robinson, owner of Harbor Crest Child Care Academy at 24251 Lakeshore Boulevard, called police to report that she suspects that one of her children that patroned the child care facility was being physically abused at home. At the time of the call, Tamika told dispatch that her and her staff have noticed different marks on the child throughout the last week. Tamika also requested an ambulance because she has noticed that the child was bleeding from her ear and has sustained a head injury. I dispatched, I was dispatched to the facility. Upon arrival, Euclid Fire Department Rescue Squad number 1341 was on scene tending to the child. I identified the child as Anaya M. Day Garrett. I observed Anaya before she was transported to the hospital and she had dry blood inside of her ear, large scabs covering the majority of her nose, and some abrasions to her scalp between her braids. Anaya was shy around strangers and would not speak with me about what happened. Anaya was transported to Euclid Hospital via EMS without incident, and the paramedics left her in the care of physician assistant and emergency department staff. Michelle Marshall, an employee of the child care facility, followed the rescue squad in her personal vehicle to the hospital. I spoke with Tamika as she reported that Anaya lives with her mother, Sierra Day, at 24451 Lakeshore Boulevard, apartment number 119. Tamika spoke with Sierra on the phone and advised her that Anaya was being transported to the hospital. Tamika reported that she took over ownership of the facility in April of 2017. On Monday of this week, May 15th, 2017, Sierra brought Anaya to the facility to drop her off. At the time, 
Anaya have fresh grapes to her nose. Sanaya told staff that Anaya fell while playing at the park. However, when staff spoke with Anaya, she told them mommy had me down at home and her nose got hurt on the carpet. Anaya also told them that mommy keeps saying that it happened at the park. Per policy, Tamika documented Anaya's injuries in an internal incident report known to them as a child observation form. When doing so, Tamika noticed a stack of similar incident reports in Anaya's file dating back to 2015. The previous reports were made by the previous owners of the facility. A few days later, on Thursday, May 18, 2017, Sierra dropped Anaya off at the facility. That is when staff noticed the dry blood in her ear and the abrasions on her head. Tamika completed another incident report and contacted the police. I asked about Anaya's behavior while she is at the child care facility. Tamika told me that Anaya constantly wants to be held and hugged. She states that she constantly asks, am I being good? Sierra came to the child care facility while I was on scene. She was advised that Anaya had been transported to the hospital via ambulance. Sierra told me that when she dropped Anaya off, she did not notice blood inside her ear or abrasions to her scalp. Sierra implied that the injuries were caused by the child care facility. Sierra denied physical abuse in her home. I asked Sierra who Anaya had been with recently and she told me her granddaddy. She stated that she was with him until about 11 o'clock on May 17, 2017. Sierra then picked her up and brought her home. I asked for his information and she identified him as, I'm not going to say the name. I asked for a phone number for him, but she stated that she did not know it and that she only communicates with him through Facebook. I asked her where he lives and she would only tell me the west side. <coughs> Excuse me. She then went on to tell me that he is not really her granddaddy, but is a friend's dad. I asked what the friend's name was and she said, I'm not going to say the name. However, she was unable to provide me with any further information on this person. Sierra then left to go to the hospital. I attempted to locate further information on the grandfather and the friend, but was unable to locate any matches within Leeds. I responded to Euclid Hospital. I spoke with the hospital social worker, Jessica Jenkins, and she advised me that she had contacted Cuyahoga County Children and Family Services. A social worker was on her way to the hospital. I spoke with nursing staff and they advised me that they had evaluated Anaya and did not locate any other scars, marks, bumps, or bruises on her body. I photographed the abrasions to Anaya's scalp, the scabs on her nose, and the dry blood in her ear, and the scratch on the left side of her chin. Anaya kept complaining of pain and dis discomfort on the right side of her face. I spoke with Sierra further about the incident in the waiting room of the emergency department. It was decided that Sierra and Anaya be separated until the county social worker arrived. While speaking with Sierra, she suggests that the staff at the child care facility hits Anaya. She told me that Anaya has told her that they hit her, but she did not take it seriously because Anaya lies. I gave Sierra the opportunity to complete a written statement to be attached to the report, but she refused, stating that she was too stressed at the time. She was given a statement form to take with her, should she wish to complete it at a later time. Sierra agreed to sign a Cleveland Clinic authorization to disclose health information form. County social worker Tawana James arrived at the hospital. I passed on the information I had and provided her with copies of the child care facilities incident reports. She re she provided with the intake number. Tawana spoke with Anaya and Anaya spoke to her. Anaya told her that mommy hits her and hurts her. A copy of this report was forwarded to the detective bureau. The photographs were uploaded into the DIMS 2 server.
been in four years. Keep that burden of proof in mind. Use your tests of credibility that we talked about yesterday and today. Use your common sense and reason as you listen to this evidence. I'm going to ask you not to jump to any conclusion as we talked about yesterday. Don't let any single piece of evidence close your mind to everything that you're going to hear over the next several days. Please withhold judgment. You will see photographs and things that we talked about yesterday. It may be difficult to not reach a conclusion or close your mind when you see some of these things. I'm just going to ask you to please keep an open mind until you've heard each and every piece of evidence in this case. And when you're done, you're going to conclude and find that the state of Ohio has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Sierra purposely caused the death of her child. Thank you. Yes. In 2015, Harbourcrest Daycare documented Anaya's injuries, and they are as follows. September 17, 2015, bruise to the right side of face, looked like a handprint. October 22, 2015, bruise to the right side of face, looked like a handprint. Child cried most of the day. September 12, 2016, bruises on face, eye, and arm. Mother stated that Anaya had fallen out of bed and she removed some bandages where Anaya had gotten shots. September 21st, 2016, bruises on her face, under her eye, and on her eyelid. Anaya stated that mom did it. October 25th, 2016, bump on head, Anaya was crying. December 1st, 2016, Anaya had a bruise under her right eye and was crying. Anaya stated that mom had hit her. Mom stated it happened at Applebee's. December 2nd, 2016, bruise on the left side of her face. Anaya stated that mom had been hitting her. December 6, 2016, rug burn type scar on left elbow. Anaya said that mom hit her. December 27, 2016. Bruise on forehead. Mommy hit me. January 18th, <clears throat> excuse me, 2017. Anaya came to school with several bruises on the face, arm, and back. Anaya has a raised bruise on her left upper forearm. When asked about it, Anaya stated that her mommy had scratched her. February 10th, 2017. Anaya has a dark colored bruise under her left eye. Anaya stated that mom did this. Staff had noticed bruises on her every day when she comes in. March 14th, 2017. Right side of lip, busted lip. May 15, 2017. Scrape on top and under nose. Mom said child fell at park. Child says mommy pushed her down at home. May 18, 2017. Right side of head and ear, swollen and dried blood. According to police, a child care worker said Anaya wanted to be held and hugged and constantly asked, Am I being good? On May 18, 2017, Anaya was transported to Euclid Hospital when daycare staff noticed dry blood in her ear and abrasions on her head. At the hospital, police gave a county social worker a report detailing all the incidents listed above. According to police, Anaya told the county social worker, Mommy hurts me, Mommy hits me. Sierra and Deontay Lewis, who is my client, who I am here on behalf of, I was, the evidence will show regarding him that he and Ms. Day did not 
before this child lost her life. Now, the issues between Anaya and her mother were long before Deontay entered their lives. Long before. <laughs> and the evidence will show that when they first looked up, the relationship was nice and fine and, you know, he, he approved of her parenting practices. But after a while, he started to disapprove of her parenting practices. And when he would speak to her about that, her response would be, this is my child. And I discipline her the way I see her. So he stepped back. <coughs> now eventually, you know, he fell in love with this woman. Probably still is. But he fell in love with her. And he fell in love with her child. Now, he did not ever move in with her. He spent time in her house. But what 27, 28 year old man, you know, with a girlfriend that's got her own place, doesn't hang out at her place. He was living at home with his parents. He never moved from his parents' home on Burnett Avenue in East Cleveland. Never. The evidence will show that. He would spend time in Sierra's house, but then he would leave and he would go kick it with his boys or go back to his parents' home or go to his brother's house. He might spend a few days there, but he was in and out. He was never a resident in her home. So he was never there every day monitoring her behavior towards his child or this child's eating habits. Yes, he lost his job in January, but the evidence will show he lost his job because she was constantly calling him at his job, telling him he needed to come home because something was wrong with the baby. The evidence will show when she would leave. Where are you approach? Yes, please go.
defense counsel's motion to strike is granted, ladies and gentlemen, you are just to disregard the last uh, statements uh, by defense counsel with respect to uh, what um, they allegedly said. Disregard it.
he called 911 because, and, and one of her eyes were open. When he discovered that this child was unresponsive, he called 911 and told them she's unresponsive. I don't know what's going on. She, she's got one eye open. I don't think she's breathing. He said, I tried to give her um, CPR, and the 911 operator says, don't try to give her CPR. And she tries to talk him through it. Then the evidence will show that then the mother chimed in and said, they had a little conversation, and in the conversation, eventually the mother says, she's not breathing. The 911 operator says, she's not breathing? The mother says, no. It's like that. No. So then the 911 operator instructs Mr. Lewis to start <coughs> chest compressions. Chest compressions. He's doing the chest compressions. And as he's doing the chest compressions, if you listen closely to the 911 tape, you can hear, you can hear the, the child. <clears throat> so, you know, seemingly from the 911 tape, seemingly Mr. Lewis thinks that's her breathing. That's her breathing. And he believes he's not doesn't realize this child is expired. So while he's on the, on the phone with the 911 operator, I think he hears the, well, you can tell that he hears the um, police officers or whoever had arrived at that time, the, the um, EMS operators who arrived at that time, trying to get in the door. And he says, okay, they're here. I have to go open the door. Now, they were down there beating on the door, sure. But he was up there trying to revive this child. And that's why it took him a while to go down and open the door, because he's desperately up there trying to revive this child. The evidence will show when this child sustained these injuries, he was nowhere around. He had nothing to do with the fatal injury that was inflicted upon this child. He was nowhere around. The medical examiner, if, if they read from their report, will say that the child sustained these injuries days to weeks before she passed. Well, at least five to six days before she passed, he wasn't there. He could not have inflicted these injuries on this child because he was not there. He got arrested because by the time EMS got there, he was there. He was there with Miss Day, trying to revive her child. He didn't know what happened to that child. He didn't know where she sustained those injuries. He couldn't tell them how she was hurt like that, because he didn't know. Evidence will show that there is no, from the crime scene pictures, you will see that there's absolutely no evidence that he was living in that apartment. You won't see any men's clothing, men's shirts and pants and shoes and things like that hanging up in closets, men's underwear in drawers, no shaving cream, no shaving kits, no uh, razors, no evidence whatsoever that he was living in that apartment, and that's because he was not. He was living with his parents, and he never moved out of their home. <clears throat> the evidence will show that he had nothing to do with her death, he never abused her, and he had no hand in her mom's hurt. Now that's what the evidence will show. Thank you. Thank you.
going to call 